Good morning and welcome to the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor for the 82nd Legislative Session. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck? Here. Senator Daly? Here. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Lang? Here. Senator Pazina? Here. Senator Scheibel? Senator Stone? Here. Chair Spearman. Here, and Mark Senator Scheibel present uh, when she arrives, please. <clears throat> Welcome to our audience joining us here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, remotely, and anyone listening over the internet. Today, we will have two bill hearings on the agenda. I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping items, basic housekeeping items. As you know, the meetings can be viewed <clears throat> through our streaming service on the legislature's YouTube channel, both of which can be accessed by the legislature's website. There are two ways members of the public can engage with us, participate throughout the process. These include in person, telephonically, instructions for telephone participation is available on today's meeting agenda. You can submit written comment to the committee email address listed <clears throat> on the agenda or by sharing your opinion on the legislator's uh, opinion application on L Nellis. Uh, I can speak this morning on Nellis. There we go. Anyone wishing to testify in person should sign in at the table at the door and please present a business card if you have one to the committee secretary. Any and all exhibits for the committee must be submitted in electronic format no later than 8 o'clock a.m. the day before the meeting. Submit exhibits to our committee manager, Terry Miller, or our committee policy analyst, Cesar Magarejo. Committee contact information may be found on the committee page in Nellis. When testifying, please remember to turn on your microphone and speak clearly. State your name and entity you represent beginning, your, beginning with your testimony. You have to speak clearly and project your voice because those who are listening over the internet may not be able to hear you. A reminder to all those who are testifying pursuant to Nevada Revised Statutes 218E.085, it is unlawful for a person to knowingly misrepresent facts when testifying before a legislative committee. A person who knowingly does so is guilty of a misdemeanor. All committee-related information is available on Nellis, which is accessible from the legislature's website. And finally, Finally, please turn off anything that's going to go, hello, I'm calling you, happy Valentine's Day, Merry Christmas, any of those ringtones, please turn your phones off. If they go off during committee, I'm going to come down and answer your phone, okay? <laughs> so turn them off so that uh, you won't disturb anyone who might be testifying. And so we're going to be begin first with uh, Senate Bill 97. This measure enacts provisions governing the interstate practice of physical therapy. Um, Minority Leader Severs Gansard, welcome. Ms. Laxalt, welcome. Please begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Chair, and good morning, members of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. For the record, my name is Heidi Severs Gansard. I represent Senate District 15 in Washoe County. Like most professions in healthcare, Nevada faces a critical shortage of quality providers and access to physical therapists. The need is particularly dire for retired and underserved residents of the state, especially those in rural and frontier areas. Physical therapists, or PTs, and physical therapist assistants, PTAs, help Nevadans reduce pain and gain strength, flexibility, and balance, with, which helps optimize their function and quality of life. And if someone who's suffered a foot fracture recently, they're tremendously helpful when you're trying to recover. And I, and I think sometimes people don't understand how, how helpful they can be you know, as, as you progress when you have an injury. Um, by enacting the Physical Therapy Compact, Licensure Compact, Senate Bill 97 will bring high quality PTs and PTAs to Nevada, will assist patients and healthcare providers to improve access to high quality care. The Interstate Compact allows a person who is licensed as a PT or PTA in a state that is a member of the compact to serve persons in the state that are to serve people in Nevada. Before such services, the compact requires a PT or PTA to meet certain requirements, including maintaining a license in good standing in another state, again, a compact state. The bill clarifies that a PT or PTA who is authorized to practice in the state pursuant to the compact is authorized to engage in the same activities as a PT or PTA who is licensed in this state. To provide further testimony, I would like to introduce the following industry experts. First, we have Leslie Adrian, who is the Director of Physical Therapy Standards with the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. Ms. Adrian will be giving an overview of the Physical Therapy Compact. And then Kelly Mae Douglas, 
who is the Pacific Southwest Regional Liaison with the Defense State Liaison Office with the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense, U.S. Department of Defense. She assists states in enacting policy to benefit military service members and their families and will discuss the combat's ability to assist the families by enabling spouses to transfer their licenses and obtain employment in Nevada more quickly. Jennifer Nash is the chair of the board of the Nevada Physical Therapy Board and Charles D. Harvey, who is the executive director of the Nevada Physical Therapy Board. They are also here to answer any questions, and some of you have been on Commerce and Labor before, which I think is probably very few looking at your panel, um, may have heard this bill before. And it's one of the initiatives that is being brought forth this session to really help with reciprocity and compacts to make sure we can um, have more providers in critical access areas, such as physical therapy. Thank you. And I've got Nina Laxalt, too. She represents the <laughs> PT <thought>. board. <laughs> yeah, it's not on my list. I'm the youngest of six. I'm used to that. Um, thank you, and um, Madam Chair, for the record, my name is Nina Laxalt, and I'm the lobbyist for the Physical Therapy Board, and I appreciate your attention um, to this issue today. All of you should have received a paper copy yesterday of some of the handouts that I'm not sure I have to go through, but um, if I can get it up. Um, it, these are just simple, uh, commonly asked questions to answer some of the concerns you might have. And then I have a map of which states are part of the compact. And then a simple, um, that's sideways, but if, if, if you need me to go through any of these, I'd be happy to. And then who's eligible and how to get a compact privilege. So. I take this time to um, sort of dig down a little bit deeper into the weeds and go through um, the benefits of having a compact in the state. And one is, of course, from the practitioner's uh, point of view, they can move easily from state to state and um, get their licenses in quite a faster uh, bit of time than it, had they had to go through the regular process. The second is to the state itself. Um, Nevada has um, a shortage of PTs in the state of Nevada, and I believe we're, we're 45th or 50th, depending on, <laughs> I almost couldn't get that one out, depending on um, what numbers you look at. So we're very low in PTs practicing in the state. So this would be very helpful for the state of Nevada. And then from the board's perspective, um, the, the relief comes from the information in the compact and what rules the compact um, participants have to follow, and that is in the states that they're practicing in, they still have to follow um, all of the rules and regulations and laws that are in place in that state. And um, as well, as the senator um, uh, explained, they go through the same vetting process, the background checks, if there's problems with a practitioner in one state, the compact notifies the s states they're going to immediately. So they're thoroughly vetted, and um, I'm going to leave it at that unless you have any questions so that we don't prolong this too long. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Minority Leader, I know you've got another um, committee meeting to go to, so if you're finished, you can leave or um, or stay. It's uh, your call. You've got some folks uh online here and in Zoom who are going to present as well? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the record. Um, Heidi Seifers gansert So yes, we, we have Kelly Mae Douglas, who you've heard before, who represents um, military, active military and veterans. And then uh, we have the expert on the compact as well. And then we also have the, the chair of the board and, and uh, Charles Harvey. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any particular order or? So I think the individual, uh, Leslie Adrian, who can go over the compact would be best. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Begin when you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Chair Spearman and members of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. The Physical Therapy Compact Commission is the governmental organization created by and consisting of the 34 jurisdictions that chose to join the Physical Therapy Compact by enacting the same model legislation the Nevada legislature is now considering. The PT Compact's purpose is to increase consumer access to physical therapy services by reducing regulatory barriers to interstate mobility and cross-state practice, all while maintaining the high standards of qualifications for physical therapy providers. 
The compact is designed to, to achieve these objectives, increasing public access to physical therapy services in the state of Nevada by providing for the mutual recognition of other member state licenses, enhance the state of Nevada's ability to protect the public's health and safety, support sport spouses of relocating military members, enhance the exchange of licensure, investigative and disciplinary information between member states, and allow a remote state to hold a provider of services with a compact privilege in the state of Nevada accountable to the state's practice standards. Oops, excuse me. To be eligible for a compact privilege under the terms and provisions of the compact, the licensee must hold a license in the home state. Every state member must utilize a recognized national examination as a requirement for licensure pursuant to the rules of the commission. Additionally, every state member must require continuing competence activities for renewal of this licensure. For an applicant to access the national physical therapy lic licensure examination, they must have completed an accredited or substantially equivalent academic program. Additionally, to be eligible for a compact privilege, licensees must be free of encumbrance on any state license and not have had any adverse action against any license or compact privilege within the previous two years. The PT compact addresses concerns about the challenges that current model of licensure has regarding access to patient care. Although new delivery care mile Although new care delivery models, ease of movement of consumers and providers, workforce issues, and new technologies are opportunities for better consumer access, these opportunities often stop at the state borders. Decreased barriers to licensing and mobility may lead to improved access to care, especially in rural or underserved areas. Participation in the PT Compact preserves the regulatory authority of the state of Nevada Physical Therapy Board to protect public health and safety through the current system of state licensure. By entering into a compact with other states, unlike national licensure initiatives, Nevada retains sovereign authority to determine the requirements for licensure in the state, as well as maintaining the state's scope of practice or work for any physical therapist or physical therapist assistant coming to Nevada on a compact privilege, which is the legal equivalent of a license under the terms of the PT Compact. The PT Compact administration and governance is handled by the PT Compact Commission. The commission is a joint public agency made up of representatives from each member state, independent of any professional association or national regulatory body. Nevada, like all member jurisdictions, would be entitled to one voting delegate who, by rule, is required to be a current State of Nevada Board of Physical Therapy member or administrator. The Compact Commission's responsibilities include verifying the applicant's eligibility for a compact privilege per the statute and rules and issuing the compact privilege with a unique compact privilege number. The members of the compact commission, including the Nevada delegate, evaluate the need for an annual assessment to compact members each year. Since the inception of the PT compact, the commission has voted to have a $0 annual assessment. So there is no fee in order to be a participant or a member of the PT Compact as a state. The PT Compact Commission is also responsible for updating and maintaining the rules, bylaws, and policies by which the Commission can effectively administer the requirements of the Compact. All amendments to the Commission's rules, bylaws, and policies must be passed by the majority of the delegates. The Commission's rules apply only to the governance of the PT Compact and have nothing to do and no impact on the scope of practice of PTs and PTAs in the state of Nevada. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this statement in support of Nevada becoming a member of the Physical Therapy Compact. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Is that you, Kelly May, or Kelly May? Hi there, haven't seen you since Hawaii. Chair. How are you? Hi, Chair, I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I will um, go ahead and make just a few comments um, to support what Leslie um, provided. Uh, so good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Kelly Mae Douglas and I serve as the Defense State Liaison Office, um, uh, Regional Liaison for the Pacific and Southwest States. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments in support of um, SB 97 on behalf of the Department of Defense and Military Families. 
uh, this bill, if approved, would improve would improve Nevadans' access to to care and allow military personnel and spouses to more easily maintain their licenses when re relocating to and from Nevada on orders um, by enacting the Physical Therapy Interstate Licensure Compact. DOD has uh, advocated for improved licensure and career portability for military spouses, um, military service members and spouses for several years. The issue is so important that Congress, through the National Defense Authorization Act, has directed the military services to incorporate an evaluation of state's facilitation of licensure reciprocity for military spouses and the extent to which they have approved interstate licensure compacts into their mission-basing decision-making processes. State policies enacting individual interstate licensure compacts relieve one of the many stressors of, the fre of frequent military moves by enabling military spouses to more quickly transfer their licenses across state lines in order to obtain employment as soon as they arrive to a new state. These policies facilitate greater career sustainability for military spouses, improving their family's financial security and overall resilience. Military spouses are disproportionately affected by state-specific licensure requirements that can cause delays and gaps in employment with over 36% of the working population of military spouses requiring state licenses to practice in their professions and an annual cross state relocation rate 10 times higher than their civilian counterparts. Accordingly, military spouses uh, experience unemployment and underemployment at significantly higher rates than their civilian peers. The Department of Defense regards licensure compacts such as the physical therapy compact as the gold standard in licensure portability for many reasons. The PT compact allows a physical therapist to hold one multi-state license in, in the home state with a privilege to practice in other member states. Um, it benefits not only active duty military spouses, but also applies to all eligible professionals to include active duty members, members of the reserve and guard. Um, reserve and guard um, spouses, veterans, their spouses, and exiting service members and their spouses. Specifically, the PT Compact provides active duty military and their spouses greater fl flexibility regarding the state that they can designate as their home state for the purposes of meeting eligibility requirements. The home state flexibility allows U.S. military members to more easily obtain compact privileges in circumstances that otherwise would make it difficult or impossible to take advantage of the provisions of the compact. Most importantly to the department, the Physical Therapy Licensure Compact provides seamless, true reciprocity for practitioners, not only when they come into Nevada, but also when they leave the state on military orders and perhaps return to Nevada permanently. The Department of Defense is very appreciative of Nevada's ongoing commitment and efforts to support members of the military and their families who sacrifice much in service to their country. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak in behalf, on behalf of military families on this important measure. Thank you, Ms. Douglas. Anyone else? That's it. Okay. That concludes. <clears throat> excuse me. That concludes the presentation. We're open for questions. We did want to comment too that this legislation's actually passed the Senate a couple times unanimously, and for whatever reason, would get hung up in the Assembly. They're, they're, they weren't as friendly to compacts in reciprocity over there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got somebody down south. Are you testifying, or are you in opposition? Just. I think that's Charles Harvey. I okay. think he's there just if we have any questions. Okay. Thank you. All right, then. Thank you. Um, committee members, any questions? Senator Pazina. Hi. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. I did just have one question, as I am one of the new members of this committee. Um, are the qualifications for physical therapists who are part of this compact the same as the qualifications that are currently met by physical therapists in Nevada? I don't know if the uh, – Leslie, if you want to answer that question – Go ahead. Sure, I can. Yes, I can answer it. Leslie Adrian, um, Director of Professional Standards for the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. Yes, so the, um, the major qualifications for every physical therapist in the United States are that they've graduated from a, an, an educational program that has been accredited by a recognized body. As of right now, there's only one recognized body in physical therapy education. So everyone has to um, have that um, level of education in order to become licensed. 
And then also to pass the national physical therapy exam, there is only one national physical therapy exam and it has a universal standard from all of the 53 jurisdictions. So yes, I would say the qualifications for anyone coming into the state are going to be equal to that of a physical therapist that can be licensed in Nevada. Thank you, uh, Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator Ganser, for bringing this forward again. Um, I think this is a, a tremendous way to bring more uh, physical therapists uh, into Nevada, and I'm strongly supporting uh, compacts, not only in, physical, in the physical therapy realm, but in nursing realms, which we, if we want to bring more professionals into the state of Nevada, in taking, taking into consideration our, our shortages, uh, certainly increasing the slots in our colleges is going to help, but that's a delay to, of many years. We need them now, not two or three years from now. So I, I read through uh, the bill, and I just want to just clarify a few things. When it comes to scope of practice, um, each state uh, has different allowances for what physical therapists can do. It's my understanding in this bill that if a person, let's say from Calif uh, from one of the compact states in the green, let's say Texas comes to Nevada, uh, if Nevada has a, uh, a scope of practice that's higher than uh, Texas, that they can practice that higher scope in Nevada. Is that correct? Ms. Ms. Adrian, I'll let you answer. So the answer is yes. So that is that they can practice yes. within the scope that it's allowed by each member state. Thank right. you. And I would assume that if it requires any continuing education, that uh, they would be able to uh, take those courses to get that certification in order to enhance that scope of practice. And I assume that would be obviously delivered by the state of, of Nevada. Yes. Yes, okay. that would be true. So if there was anything in specific that Nevada required um, in order to do a certain technique, then the physical therapist or physical therapist assistant that was coming to Nevada on a compact privilege would have to maintain and re meet those requirements. Okay, so uh, obviously there's gonna be a background check uh, with the board of uh, physical therapy in, in, the, in the neighboring states that uh, the applicant is, is originating from. Uh, obviously there's no disciplinary actions, there's no encumbrances against their licenses, but as they practice in Nevada, if they were in fact to get an encumbrance, um, they would immediately lose their certification, if you will, here, and we would communicate with the uh, board in their home state. Is that how that works? So I can um, answer that question, yes. Leslie Adrian, uh, if an individual has a disciplinary issue within the state of Nevada and they're working on a compact privilege, then the Nevada State Physical Therapy Board has the ability to take action uh, disciplinary action against that compact privilege. Um, and then, like you said, there would be a notification that would go out to all member states. So, and then the other, the state that is issuing the home license could then take action against the license if they, if they want to, if they choose to. Um, the other thing to note is that if an individual is disciplined against their compact privilege in any state, they're going to lose compact privileges in all states. It's because in order to be eligible, you have to have no encumbrances right. and no adverse actions for the last two years. So there's actually quite a big consequence to having a disciplinary action in a state. Um, it's called a compact privilege for a reason. It is not a, a guarantee. It's not a right. It is someone with an exemplary uh, record of physical therapy service. And um, if an individual were to then lose that compact privilege, they are free to pursue licensure in any state, and then the licensure board would make their determination. But they would not be they would not be eligible for compact privileges until at least those two years have passed. Okay, thank you. One final question, Madam Chair, and then uh, just a comment. Um, I, re I read in the bill about jurisprudence. Uh, laws are different uh, governing professions in each state, so uh, I assume that uh, there's a, an exam that would be uh, dedicated to the, the law portion of the profession uh, by the physical therapy board here in, in Nevada when an applicant comes through. 
Hello, this is Jennifer Nash, chair of the Nevada Physical Therapy Board. And yes, thank you for the question. We would require them to pass our jurisprudence exam before um, issuing them the privilege to practice in Nevada. Fantastic. And just a final comment. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. McDouglas uh, in, in trying to help some of these military spouses that have to travel from one base to another, one, one state to another to allow their uh, spouses that are licensed in various professions to be able to, to work uh, in the states in which their loved ones are, are serving in. So um, I appreciate the DOD's uh, efforts. And uh, Senator uh, Gansert, uh, it seems like Many of the, the issues have been addressed in the bill. I think it's very comprehensive. I'm gonna applaud you for bringing it forward and I look forward to supporting it. Senator Daly. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I will start out as maybe I was one of those people on the other side in the assembly that wasn't a big fan of, of compacts. And I've, and I've read, and this is very similar to the ones we've read half a dozen times, uh, understand that. So there are <clears throat> just some things that I, that I don't like. I think the part about the military spouses makes a lot of sense and, and I have no issues with that. I know we already have some provisions in, this, in law that allows uh, for emergencies. The governor can do that and people can come in for emergencies and, and I understand that doesn't uh, uh, cover everything. Um, so without wasting the committee's time on a whole bunch of stuff, there's just a couple of questions maybe for the uh, physical therapy board uh, people or somewhere. So is the shortage um, statewide or is it mainly in the rural areas? Now I can see that in the rural areas, someone's injured and there's just not as many uh, practitioners uh, out there. Uh, so is it is it everywhere? Because from what I see in, at least in Northern Nevada, the doesn't seem to be a shortage of physical therapists, uh, but if there's an issue in the in other parts of the state, uh, can you give me a little information on that? Yes, Senator Jay, thank you for the question. Jennifer Nash, Chair of the Nevada Physical Therapy Board for the record. There is a shortage here in Southern Nevada, as well as through many rural areas. I would say the whole state, um, though your experience it seems is a bit different. I know that most physical therapy clinics have waits of up to two weeks, even greater towards six weeks for an evaluation of a physical therapist, particularly in my field of neurologic physical therapy. So we've found a great shortage in Nevada and we are having a difficult time actually finding um, employees to, to just have enough staff to provide services that are um, being requested. So, if I can follow up, thank you. Yeah. So, along those <clears throat> along those lines, uh, certain areas of the state uh, may need uh, have more sh shortages for a variety of reasons, and then certain disciplines within the physical therapy area, like you mentioned on the neurological uh, physical therapy. Is there any provisions or anything that's uh, in the compact or that uh, the state's going to benefit that's going to get the people? to the areas that we want? Is there any incentives? There, there's, there's, in other words, having the compact uh, may just have more people that do the regular routine stuff competing against people that are already here rather than getting and fixing the need uh, in the rural areas or in certain disciplines. Uh, is there anything like that uh, in there? I didn't see it. Thank you, Senator Dave, for the question. <laughs> Yeah, Jennifer Nash, for the record, not specifically in the compact language would you find that, but what we would see is more of people being able even to provide telehealth in the rural areas, which is being um, something that more and more uh, adults as well as pediatric patients are utilizing through physical therapy, um, getting the education and the knowledge to those that need it um, have been incredibly important through this COVID pandemic and keeping our, our Nevadans active. And so I think through the compact, we will also see people that are able to practice through telemedicine that haven't in the past. And those people could address specifically the rural areas. I do think also that we would benefit from more people being able to come into the state, um, such as travelers, 
or even those you know who are thinking about trying out Nevada to live that is going to be a lower lower cost and a quicker route to licensure through the compact than going through the traditional process. Appreciate that. I have uh, one more question, then a comment, if I can, Madam Chair. Sure. Okay. So I think the last question that I'll ask, I got a whole bunch, but I kind of know the answers already. But uh, um, for the is for the compact uh, uh, person and the expert on the compact, and it's just a. Um, a question. I know in section two, the very first uh, section of the deal, it says that uh, we're joining this and legally joining the compact. And it says in substantially, substantially the form set forth in this section. So I'm assuming that there are slight variations in other states that are already in the compact. What might those variations be? And could you get them to us so we can see? Now, I understand the first compact, and then there may have been some updates and various things as uh, various states joined. If uh, there's no substantive changes, I, I would just be curious if somebody else has a better deal than us. The way I read that is that each state, not every single one of them in each state is exactly the same. Uh, and so it's substantially the same, but what are the differences? Um, yes, sir. Leslie Adrian, Director of Professional Standards, um, for the record. Um, in reality, the um, model statute really needs to be passed as the model statute. One of the updates has been there is a reference to um, the code with regard to um, defining military members and military spouses um, in that section. And um, it had come to our awareness that um, there was a better citation to use um, and there was some reorganization of some federal statutes and, and um, regulations. So we are counseling people who are enacting the compact going forward that they should change that code section. Um, so that would be a change that has been um, enacted. But other than that, there's been no change to the, um, to the language. There will be, um, some changes with regard to the way some bill um, numbering systems are from different states to different states. So like where ours may be like a section A or um, section one, um, based on the reviser standards in other states, they may be section A may be section one or B2 or the way they use their Roman numerals. So it's things of that sort, but as to the actual um, um, language, there there really is no difference from state to state, and everybody is getting the same deal. Yeah, understood. So in that regard, those would be some of the things that uh, the commission would change in the bylaws or create a rule, which then would be binding on, on each state. And that's part of what my problem is with that, is that to some degree, whether we like it or not, and I know people argue with me about it, is the states and, in fact, the legislature cedes some authority to this commission that would otherwise have to come through the legislature. That's one of my hang-ups. I'm not saying I can't get there. I'm just saying that I'm not uh, not a fan uh, entirely. So I, I will follow up with uh, uh, Nina and some others uh, on that. Uh, but anyway, those are my comments. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. Um, I see this as a shining bright light on Nevada. Um, having access to health care really helps Nevadans. And then also, um, it's military friendly, which of course is near and dear to my heart, um, because it is a challenge, my son being in the military, having spouses moving every four years and getting qualified for various occupations. But um, I have Three questions, if I may. The first one, if they were to come in without this camp compact, what exactly do they have do they have to go through? Starting from ground zero. Thank you for the question, Jennifer Nash, uh, chair of the board for the record. I um, was pausing only to see if uh, Director Harvey wanted to take the question, but I'm happy to answer. When you are coming in as a licensed physical therapist, uh, you would fill out an application for an endorsement license. 
Um, that way you would um, then go through the process of getting your fingerprints done for your FBI check and um, having all of your uh, records forwarded to the board, specifically that licensure exam that um, Ms. Adrian mentioned. So we get all of our the records put together. Um, unfortunately, that, to be honest, is taking about eight weeks to 10 weeks at this moment. Um, but then once we get all of the information, the board is able to uh, give a license within, um, within a day, as long as all of the um, requirements are met. So it's mainly filling out the application and getting your um, FBI check, as well as um, making sure your records are forwarded to the board. And if I've forgotten anything, please add to it, Mr. Harvey. Yes, good morning, members of the committee. Um, Director Harvey, for the record, I would just add that there is a reduced fee for military um, applicants coming from other states. But as, as, um, as Chair Nash mentioned, the, um, the background fingerprint process can be um, quite lengthy and can take up to 10 weeks. So that's the longest part of the delay. Thank you, Chair Spearman, for a follow-up. So I know that um, a lot of times um, military bases would be where they would be. So um, I know my colleague had asked about, uh, you know, the need. Um, I know that there's need in Southern Nevada. I just wondered how many of uh, these spouses are potentially out there that are PTs, PTAs. Have, have we done any numbers on that, on how many are maybe moving into the area or looking to move, or do you have applications in process that this could help them? Kelly, I don't know if you have any um, uh, any statistics on this. I know that we do. We do not. There really isn't a good way for us to track at the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. Um, who is a military spouse and also a licensed PT or PTA. We, we don't have any hard numbers on that. And lastly, I just wondered, looking at the states, which states have the most rigorous uh, qualifications to get in, you know, to get into the profession, and which ones have the less, the least rigorous? Uh, this is Leslie Adrian, again, for the record. Um, honestly, the, the requirements are fairly similar. So the major requirements are the educational program, and that has to be um, a program that has been um, accredited by a recognized accrediting body in the, by the board. There is only one accrediting body uh, in physical therapy education at this time. So every state is going to be accepting an educational program that has been accredited by the same, um, by the same organization. The second um, requirement, major requirement is to pass the national physical therapy examination, uh, which of which there is only one. It's actually developed by the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. And there is a universal pass score that has been accepted by all 53 jurisdictions. So uh, that requirement is also the same. So when you're looking at initial um, requirements, those major credentials and requirements are the same across this across the United States. So there isn't really a different a difference between one to the other. Um, you start to get into other requirements and they're typically more administrative. So it would be, do you need um, uh, professional liability insurance is something that some states require that other states do not. Um, there may be specific educational, like continuing education type things that are required. Like uh, some states will require um, for any licensee, um, a course in um, recognizing sex trafficking. Um, um, there may be a requirement for um, implicit bias training. Um, there may be other requirements include um, 
let's see, things like uh, uh, letters of recommendation. So they're really more administrative requirements for initial licensure rather than actual like credentials or um, preparation type requirements. Thank you. Uh, just before I go to Senator Hammond, um, I'm going to ask our policy analyst, uh, because recently President Biden signed a uh, reciprocity, um, uh, into law reciprocity rule, and so there's a one-pager that I want, uh, I'd like for say, so can you read that, please? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Malgarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, one second. So it, on... Early January, uh, President Biden signed H.R. 7939, which is the overall Veterans Auto and Education Improvement Act of 2022. And within this act is the Military Spouse uh, Licensing Relief Act. Uh, this is a one-pager from uh, Representative Hyden Smith, which I believe is from California, and I believe is the sponsor of this measure uh, and the bill summary uh, summarizes that the, uh, the, this Military Spouse Act amends the Silver Service Members Relief Act of 2003 to require states to recognize service members' spouses' occupational license from another state if the service member and the service member spouses move across state lines on account of a permanent change of station order. Uh, the Service Members Relief Act already provides a number of protections for active duty service members and their families, including rental agreements, judici civil judicial proceedings, installment contracts, and credit card and mortgage interest rates. Uh, this legislation would not preempt state law on how the licenses are used, as military spouses would still be required to comply with standards of practice, discipline, and continuing education requirements. Additionally, this legislation ensures that operational interstate licensure compacts would not be disrupted by the federal law. And again, I believe this was signed by President Biden on January 6th, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Hammond. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Madam Minority Leader. Um, I just had, and I was going to sit back and listen, and, and but now that we've had several questions, sometimes some things come to mind. Um, my colleague was concerned about compacts in general, um, listed out some of those. It kind of reminded me of my classes when we were talking you know, political philosophy, talking about Hobbes, talking about you know state of nature and how you have total freedom in the state of nature philosophically when you're in that in that position, you know, the freedom to do whatever you want, right? And so the compact does have some downside, right? You, you, sometimes you, in order to live in a society, you give up some of your freedoms and you start to list off the ones that you're able to live with. So the compact has a downside, right? You, you give up some of your freedom as a state to, to decide some things. But I wanted to give you an opportunity at this point to talk about the pros and the cons. I mean, if anybody knows how to do a box about the good things, it's, it's, it's you. And so, um, I think that it'd be great if, if, if I could hear, and maybe for the benefit of others as well, sort of that, that might be the downside is you, you give up some of that, a little of that autonomy. It's not much, right? Because as we heard twice now, uh, when, when it comes to what it takes to become a physical therapist, almost anywhere in the, in the United States, almost universal, right? The, the requirements are about the same almost everywhere. Very you know, little, little variations here and there perhaps, but most for the most part the same. So we're not giving up much. So tell us what we're gaining if you could do it succinctly, I think that would be very helpful to me to talk about what we what we gain. Um, so the sort of the pros. You're going to be the, the pros right now. Um, thank you for the record, Senator Heidi Seifer Scanser, and through the chair to Senator Hammond. And so when I look Go at this, Go to Red. Oh, thank you. Okay. When when I look at this, one of the key terms was which Miss um, Adrian Adrian Leslie I get their name crossed um, pointed out it's a privilege. So these have to be individuals who are in good standing. We've heard a couple of times now that the licensure requirements, the national licensure, the test, the board, is the same across the country. And we've heard the educational requirements, they have to be in a, at a, uh, come from an accredited institution. So those are the same. So I guess I'm not recognizing a downside. What I'm seeing is a way for us to bring more folks on board 
Now, when you talk about limiting freedoms, you can practice within the scope established by the state. And I think that's important because each state has d well defined what the scopes may be. So um, if someone practices beyond the scope that Nevada allows, maybe that would be they're giving up something. But again, with the opportunity to bring more folks in state, especially um, active military and their, and their family, I think it's critical that we look at, it. and we also realize, you know, that we've had a time of crisis, and it was mentioned earlier, like the governor, under an emergency uh, power, or EO, potentially, he can allow folks to practice um, across state lines that ordinarily wouldn't have, and we, we faced that during the pandemic. Well, all those expire with the EO. When you, when you change leadership or the emergency expires, th those go away. This is something, again, that creates a privilege opportunity for those in high standing with similar um, educational and national board standards to practice in our state and, and we have heard you know repeatedly about the demand that we really need a higher level of supply and for those of you who, of you who've ever been injured <clears throat> you need help right away it's not like one of these things where you want to wait a month if you have come out of a boot and you could hardly walk you need someone to really help you to guide you to start moving your foot or moving your arm or moving your wrist or whatever it be. So I don't really see the downside except for an, an individual who maybe practices within, within a greater scope from another state who moves to Nevada and maybe we're more limited. Thank you. Additional questions? So um, I just want to make a couple of comments. I, I want to ask um, Ms. Douglas, you mentioned something about mission basing. And I'm trying to bring the conversation back to the, I guess, the original intent of the compact. What does mission basing mean for, for, for anyone who, who has not used that lingo as part of DOD? Yes, uh, Chair Spearman, thank you for the um, question. Um, so mission basing is simply, um, so for the each military service, um, whenever there is a decision that needs to be made um, regarding bringing um, a, a, a mission capability, could be all, you know, a small mission that requires one or two personnel to come to the state, or it could be a, um, a large mission where you would bring a whole unit to a state or a headquarters like uh, a couple years ago um, when Space Force was um, stood up, they were looking at states' um, uh, feasibility for um, hosting headquarters, um, the headquarters Space Force base. Um, and so it, it could be small or big or even, um, you know, decisions to take a base away or, or what have you. Um, Congress has required now that in that in the evaluation process, each military service has to incorporate um, a number of quality of life measures, which um, which speaks to the the the, the services and DoD and Congress's um, appreciation of when you when you put a, a unit in a in a state, if you um, are putting them in a location that isn't supportive of the military spouse employment or the child education um, experience, that it, it's that uh, it's uh, diminishes the family's family ready uh, the, the family's resilience, and so. Um, now that that el there's an element of um, quality of life measures that have to be looked at by each military service when they, whenever they're looking at um, adding or taking away um, um, mission capabilities. Is that the same thing as BRAC base realignment and closing? Um, that that is the extreme version. That's the extreme, um, uh, you know, uh, degree of a mission basing decision. Yes. So um, I didn't hear anyone mention it, but I think it was in 2021, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense sent a letter to all of the governors, I believe it was, um, indicating that um, the ability for spouses to be able to find employment, um, housing, um, schools, education system, all of those things would now be a major part of the calculation in terms of when they do the BRAC, base realignment and closing, every, every five or 10 years, something like that, they go through and say, should we keep this, should we not, should we move it or whatever. Uh, and so, and I think that was mentioned, as a matter of fact, it was presented, I believe, in um, <clears throat> one of our interim committees uh, that someone actually pr presented it. So the other thing that I wanna, uh, just, just a couple of numbers, um, uh, 24, 27, uh, one, 1,917, 
uh, and those are the numbers. 27 is the average age of an E5 sergeant, and they make uh, their base pay is $2,774 uh, a month. Um, I don't know that we can find any um, apartment in most cities in Nevada or anywhere in the country, really, for that matter, that you're going to pay, you know, half of that or 40% of that. Um, and also, I heard you say a couple of times that there was a national board test, and one of my nephews is a licensed massage uh, therapist, and they have a national test as well. And if you don't pass that national test, you can't, you know, he couldn't practice in Nevada. Um, but the other things that, um, that, that, that caught my attention um, are two colors, blue and gold. Uh, blue Star families are those who have um, a member, family member, who's serving in the military, um, who is serving uh, on deployment, um, either someplace in the States or uh, what we call downrange. Uh, that means in a combat area. And the Gold Star families we've probably heard a lot about because those are the ones uh, who have uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and I remember a couple of years ago, uh, I want to say it was maybe 2015, I had a bill that would have given military families priority for daycare. And one of the people that came to me and talked to me uh, told me about how she was having to start her life all over again because her husband was killed in a roadside bomb. And she had to leave where she was, and she came back to Nevada because that's where her family was. Um, and so when, when I look at this, I'm, I'm thinking, what does this mean to our military? And um, the latest statistics say that there is less than 1% of the current um, U.S. population that has ever served in the military, less than 1%. Um, and so anyone who served after... 1975, served because we wanted to, because conscription was gone. So everybody in the military right now, or previously, if you, 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 you served after 1975, it's because you wanted to. And the numbers that I gave you, $1,900, that's for an E4. An E4, two years of service. So it, it can't be for the money. <laughs> I'm just saying. It can't be for the money. Um, and and when military members, I was stationed at Fort Hood for five years, and I was only on station consecutively or consistently for one year. Um, other than that, I was deployed all over the country, sometimes, you know, overseas. Um, I was not married at the time, but I would imagine that uh, if I were, I'd leave my family behind. Um, and whatever work um, the spouse can get is what they can get. So I heard someone say 10 weeks to do the background check and all the other administrative things. Uh, and if you are looking at trying to, and base housing, let me say that, base housing um, is not sufficient anymore. Um, and so we have a lot of our, our service members who live off base. Um, and do they get a housing allowance? Yes, they do. But is it enough? No, it's not. And so there are very few families that can subsist on a single uh, income. And I think this was one of the things that President Biden said when he signed um, HR, whatever that number was. Yeah, when he, when he signed that bill. So um, I guess I'm kind of biased about this because I've, as company commander, I've seen um, how, how some of my troops were barely making it. Um, and this was like 20 years ago when I was 25 years ago when I was company commander, maybe 30. Anyway, um, but, but, but I know what they were facing, and so, you know, H.R. 7939. And so um, I, I, think, I think the purpose of the bill is basically for spouses. And uh, it didn't pass the assembly last time, but you have H.R. 7939 that is in place, um, and that's national. So one of the things that... Um, and you can correct me, but I think if what the compact would do would be to ensure that those practicing in Nevada um, from another place, uh, those standards would be met, um, and it's not just automatically assumed. Um, so, so we have military spouses, blue and gold star, blue somebody serving somewhere, um, and um, there's a blue star uh, chapter at Nellis that I've spoken to a couple of times. And um, I think my colleague, um, 
Senator Daley mentioned something about the rural areas. Um, I know that there's a Navy base up in Fallon. Uh, and we have National Guard here uh, in Nevada. Um, I'm a retired military police officer, and I know that military police are deployed more than most other um, MOSs, military occupational specialties. Uh, and our military, our guard uh, military police company has been deployed, I want to say, maybe in the last 10 years. Uh, I know that they were deployed a lot when Governor Sandoval was in office, and they were deployed uh, at least four times while Governor Sisolak was in office. And so every time they're deployed, that means that they go someplace. Every time, and usually it's someplace where they're going to get shot at. And so when they're deployed, then they leave someone behind. Um, hopefully they come back home. Sometimes they don't. Um, so I'm looking at this from the standpoint, Senator Hammond said, what do we give up? Um, and I guess I want to flip that around because um, we live in the land of the free because we're the home of the brave. So less than 1% of the population has agreed to serve in harm's way or not so that we could be here doing this today. And so, you know, give up, eh. uh, what do we get? I say appreciation uh, for what they do and appreciation for their families. Uh, please don't hear this as a lecture, but I'm, I'm, I'm really sensitive when it comes to this sort of thing because uh, we don't have that many people who are agreeing to serve anymore. Don't want to do it, can't do it, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but for those who do, um, I think we owe not just, you know, I tell people, don't say thank you for your service, don't tell me that. Not unless you're willing to give me a tangible act of gratitude for my service, because that's just words. So. Um, it, it may not be perfect, um, but I look at this, not just Kelly Mae Douglas said, mission basing, and that means do we keep the bases that we have here? She mentioned Space Force, uh, and I know at one time Nevada was, they were thinking about Space Force for Nevada. I don't know why we didn't get it, but, um, but that means that the bases that are here, <clears throat> every time they go through BRAC, base realignment and closing, every time they do that, there's a list that they go through. And if this is one of those items on the list in terms of quality of life, um, we probably don't want to put the bases that we already have here in jeopardy. But let me back up again. I'm saying again, you know, for me, <clears throat> if it's something for military spouses, I always have to, have to err, if that's correct, on the side of um, the active military or a, a veteran. Um, I don't know, I think Mr. Megalejo is a veteran. Anybody else on the committee? So, so it's not that I'm an expert, but I know what this feels like for our troops. And so for me, it's, it's, it really is a matter of not just quality of life, but thank you for your service. That doesn't mean anything to me, unless you show some tangible example. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Anyway. I understand that there was an amendment, but there was one um, that was Thank leaked. you, Madam Chair, for the record, Senator Heidi Seifers Gansert. We withdrew the amendment. We realized that uh, we didn't need to change some of the language. It was close to what was already in there. Um, and, and I want to thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and your experience in the military. And I would cl cast, classify it as leaning in. You lean in for active military and for veterans every day, so thank you. Additional questions, comments? Thank, thank you. I appreciate your consideration. Uh, thank you. Or SB 97. Okay. Thank you. Um, and with that, we have anybody here in support? Senate Bill 97. Anyone down south? Broadcast, do we have anyone on the phone? Chair, your public line is open and working, but you have no callers at this time. Let's give it a couple of minutes, and we'll see if someone shows up. Anyone show up? No? Okay. Chair, your line is still open and working, and you have no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Anyone here in opposition? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, or down south? Anyone in opposition? Anyone here want to testify neutral? Okay, with that. Um, Leader, do you have any closing remarks? <clears throat> 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate your consideration today on SB 97. And you're welcome to get a hold of me if you have any offline questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to take a matter of personal privilege and say uh, most of you who were here during the last session know that I was on a scooter because I could barely walk and I could barely breathe. Um, so recovering from COVID required uh, physical therapist as also a respiratory therapist because I had to get my lungs back. And one of the things that happened uh, was that they didn't have enough at the VA. And so I had to go out to what they call community care. And guess what? <laughs> there weren't a lot out there. Um, and this was Vegas. So um, I wish we could do something about um, the practice of medicine because we certainly don't have enough doctors. Anyway, thank you so much. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 97, and we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 91. Authorizes licensed clinical and drug counselors to supervise a certified problem gambling counselor interim. Intern. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the committee. I'm Roberta Lang, representing Senate District 7 in Clark County. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present Senate Bill 91 that seeks to authorize a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor to supervise a certified problem gambling counselor intern under circum certain circumstances. Pleased today to be joined by Sarah Adler from Silver State Government Relations, who will provide additional information. It is well established in the United States and Nevada that we have a shortage of both primary care physicians, behavioral health providers, which have been exacerbated in recent years by heightened provider burnout and retirements. Currently, nearly 95% of the state's population lives in an area designated by the federal government as having a shortage in mental health professionals. The lack of providers can affect both the person's ability to access appropriate care or receive a timely diagnosis which applies for Nevadans suffering from alcohol, drug, or gambling addiction. For example, according to the 2021 health workforce in the Nevada chart book, Nevada om lost almost 800 licensed alcohol and drug counselors between 20 2010 and 2020, 533 licensed in 2020 compared to 1,330 in 2010. The number of certified problem gambling counselors who may treat gambling disorders is even less. According to the Board of Examiners for Alcohol, Drug, and Gambling Counselors, there are currently 24 certified problem gambling counselors in Nevada, 10 of whom are ap approved by the Board to supervise interns. Six individuals are certified by the Board to conduct their problem gambling counselor internships. The number of problem gambling counselors is not enough to given the increase of adults and youth reporting symptoms of gambling addiction. According to information from the Department of Health and Human Services, <coughs> researchers estimate that more than 125,000 Nevada adults are problem gamblers and that about 2% of Nevada's youth may suffer from gambling problems before completing high school. Gambling disorders also disproportionately impact seniors, military veterans, and people struggling with other mental health issues and addictive disorders. And for these reasons, I'm happy to sponsor Senate Bill 91, which seeks to increase the number of problem gambling counselors in Nevada by providing more flexibility to who may supervise the gambling interns. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Adler, who will go through the bill with you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Adler with Silver State Government Relations, and this morning I'm pleased to be here on behalf of a client of ours, New Frontier, which is a residential treatment and certified community behavioral health center in Fallon. New Frontier and a variety of partners in this line of work have identified, as Senator Lang has beautifully described, and I'll, I'll skip uh, the background information that she has provided for you, but they have identified this opportunity to increase the pipeline to create additional certified problem gambling counselors in Nevada. And that is to extend the capacity of what we call licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselors, whom I 
considered to be the gold star in behavioral health. LCADCs have master's level training in both mental illness and addiction. And as work goes on in this area, uh, the work, people who work in this area have come to understand that individuals with what is now called an addictive disorder related to problem gambling uh, often are experiencing some forms of mental illness as well. So this bill in section one increases as a, an opportunity for LCADCs, the opportunity to become a problem gambling intern supervisor only under the condition that they have received and uh, 30 hours of instruction in problem gambling and 12 hours of instruction of supervising problem gambling interns. So that is the primary change that this bill brings about to NRS 641C and Section 2 makes conforming changes. Uh, I am ready with the Senator to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. You have anyone else that's going to present? Okay. Um, Committee, any questions? Senator Daly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just question technical maybe. Uh, so you have your addiction and the drug and alcohol counselors and then gambling counselors are different. How much overlap or what's the separation in the, in the training or the uh, obviously, they have different titles and different focuses and a specialty, uh, but how much do they overlap? Uh, Sarah, Sarah Adler, for the record, uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Senator Daly. Just go direct. In my analysis of this, I see that a problem gambling counselor uh, is required to to be enrolled in the field of study in one of a, an appropriate field of social work. And then they receive additional specialized training in problem gambling. And to become a certified counselor, really, I would say the bulk of the work is receiving 2,000 hours of supervision. At the intern level, you receive 2,000 hours of supervision from a qualified problem gambling supervisor. And uh, so that is the path that is available right now. By adding LCADCs as supervisors, we actually create access to supervisors with uh, most assuredly a master's level of training in mental health and addiction. So I think we're moving forward in the opportunity to provide expertise to problem gambling interns. Sorry about that. I was uh, trying to just get the, get the feeling because what you're requiring the person that's going to be doing the supervisor, supervising of the gambling addiction intern is the same 30 hours that you have to have in order to yes. be a, uh, an intern in the first place. So, but I'm assuming, and I was trying to ask and, and just, you know, make sure I have the, the comfort level, and I think it's the case is, so if you're going to be a counselor for any of these addiction problems, probably 80% of the training you receive is going to be the same in how you certain differences on how you might treat uh, one addiction versus another or what some of the issues are but 80 percent of it's basically how you provide counseling and those types of so I just wanted I wanted to make sure that that was the case and that uh, it's not like these people don't have the experience and ability to supervise and then they're getting to 12 hours on the training as well um, fi final question if I can madam chair is uh, So is there a shortage of the gambling counselors uh, and then, or is it a, a business type uh, deal where they don't have them, they provide all of the services or there is a separation where somebody says, hey, I want to also provide gambling counseling, but I don't have the senior person, so I have staff that does this part of it so then they can develop some of that. And I know that will enhance what we're trying to get to, so I'm not saying that's a downside. I was just curious if that was part of the scenario. Uh, where you, you can't get the, the gambling counselor supervisor because there's not enough of them. So, uh, uh, Sarah Adler, for the record, thank you, Senator Jaley. Uh, you're hitting on a key point. Uh, yes, we have a significant shortage of problem gambling counselors in Nevada. 
And that is something that a whole group of stakeholders, the Advisory Committee on Problem Gambling, uh, the Nevada uh, Gambling Unit within DPBH, um, and training organizations such as CASAT are working on. And so something good happened. Uh, the, the DPBH unit, the Nevada Gambling Services, was able to put together funded internships for uh, 2022 and 2023 to incent folks to choose this line of behavioral health. So we have good news in Nevada is that a lot of stigma has moved away from behavioral health and we have an increase in, for example, licensed clinical social workers. But bad news is this more traditional form of behavioral health is under-resourced. But before you can sign up to be an intern, you have to have someone committed to being your supervisor. So it's really important that we increase the opportunity to find someone who's willing to be a supervisor. So there are 102 LCADCs who are currently qualified to become supervisors if they were to take an addiction addition the 30 hours and the 12 hours. So we can't activate the interns until we have the supervisors. Thank you, um, Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. I see the need and um, there is a shortage. It's much like student teaching in that you're building capacity um, and access again to this for people who are struggling. I can see the need. Um, what are qualifications right now currently to be a gambling counselor? So there are, um, there's a super cool chart <laughs> <laughs> from the uh, cassette and it, um, it identifies, it asks you a potential applicant about your academic uh, uh, status and then it puts you on one of two pathways if you already are licensed as another behavioral health professional there's a much faster pathway and honestly um, I think if we weren't so under resourced in behavioral health across the board we might have access to a lot more counselors and I'm hopeful that we'll get some trans maybe by by bringing LCADCs into supervision we will also bring some more into problem gambling counseling. The other pathway, if you are not already licensed, is that you must be enrolled in, in a, a field of social studies that they identify in statute. And then you go through the specific training related to problem gambling, and then the 2,000 hours of supervision. So that allows you to become a counselor and then you have to have practice as a counselor for a significant period of time before you are allowed to apply to be an intern. So there's only five counselors today that even could become supervisors. I misspoke. So. Thank you so much. I commend you for the bill. Thank you. You mentioned a chart, but I don't think we have it up on Nellis. So no, could you, provide you that? do not. I will send this forward okay. through your committee staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Senator Scheibel. Um, thank you so much. I also have a couple of follow-up questions kind of along the lines of my colleagues. And so I just want to understand, you're saying there are five people in State of Nevada right now that if this bill were to pass, uh, today they can't supervise a problem gambling intern, or sorry, a problem gambling counselor intern, but tomorrow they could, or once the bill's effective, they could. There are five of those. Uh, Sarah Adler, for the record, apologies for, for not clearly communicating. If, if you enact this bill, we will have access to 102 more potential problem gambling supervisors. That's how many LCADCs are fully qualified as an LCADC and could choose to take the additional training that would allow them to become problem gambling counselors, supervisors. But, but have any of them done that additional training yet? I, no, I, I, I am not, a, Sarah Adler, again, not aware of the answer to that question because we and, haven't, right, we so, haven't the, authorized them to become that. And the reason that I'm asking is I'm trying to get at whether there is another reason that up an LA, 
D A L C A D C L C A D C would take thirty hours of instruction related to problem gambling. Is that something that they might ordinarily do in the course of their continuing education? Is it something that's included in a lot of master's programs, or are we depending on these L A D Cs to L D C As L A C D C L D D As? I should have acronym cards. Sorry, I'm sorry. I got L G B T Q I A and then I just quit. Um, <laughs> And so um, are we depending on them to take the initiative to take an additional 30 hours of training just because they want to supervise these additional interns? Sarah Adler, for the record, I have discovered in my work that there's quite a uh, degree of communication among the licensed professionals who are licensed by the Board of Examiners of Alcohol, Drug, and Problem Gambling. So if this... Uh, bill is to pass, I feel certain that, as you have said, through communications, through continuing education uh, opportunities that are offered, that sort of thing, LCADCs will become aware of this opportunity. It is my understanding that some of our licensed professionals in, enjoy the work of supervision. I can't say my the people who supervised me as a student teacher, I'm not sure they enjoyed that. But uh, some, some do, and then there is compensation for being a supervisor. So that leads me to my last question, which is, and I hope I'm not opening up a huge can of worms, is the additional training really necessary? Or could an LCADC supervise these interns without an additional 30 hours. I'm just thinking about the people I actually know who work in this space and a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor who's been doing this for 25 years has worked with countless problem gamblers. And I would feel confident if somebody, somebody who wanted to get an internship addressing problem gambling wanted to go to their, you know, institution, their organization where they provide counseling services to people with addiction problems was going to supervise somebody who's going to specialize in problem gambling, even if that 25-year veteran counselor didn't have a specialty in gambling addiction treatment. Am I missing something? Sarah Adler, for the record, and, and I'm, I'm not a longtime expert in this area, but in the study that I've done to help support this bill, um, I have noted uh, when you look at the treatment data and they do 30, 60, 90 day, one year reviews, you find that the conditions of stress related to problem gambling are somewhat different than the conditions of stress that are being treated with other mental health or addictive disorders. So I would certainly say the 30 hours is beneficial. Whether it's absolutely essential, I would not say I'm qualified to speak on that. But I, I, do, um, I do share with you that there are well-established uh, training programs, not only CASAT in our state, but there is the opportunity to take these 30 hours online, for example. So the 30 hours are quite accessible um, in different, in, because they're uh, offered in different forms. So um, excellent question. Uh, I have only shared my thoughts. Thank you. Then maybe I'll, I'll share a final thought, which is that I, I'm, I'm with you on the bill. I think it's a great idea. If um, you know other stakeholders get on board and they would even be willing to make it easier for LCADCs to become supervisors to problem gambling counselor interns, I would support the bill with an amendment that makes it even easier. Thank you. Additional questions? Any members? No? Okay. okay. Anyone else to present? No? So we'll go now to those who are those who are here. Um, Carson City in support. Anyone here in support? And I don't see anyone in Vegas, but if there's anyone hiding behind the door and you're in support, come forward. 
Good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. My name is Leslie Pittman. I'm here today as a member of the Nevada Advisory Committee on Problem Gambling, whose members are appointed by the Nevada governor and whose mission is to support effective problem gambling prevention, education, treatment, and research programs throughout Nevada. Our vision is to improve the public health of Nevadans through a sustainable and comprehensive system of programs and services that reduce the impact of problem gambling on our communities. Nevada established SB 357 in the 2005 session. The Advisory Committee on Problem Gambling determines the ways that the funds will be utilized to support our main areas of services, prevention and education, problem gambling treatment, research and evaluation, and importantly, workforce development. This bill, SB 91, would help increase the number of supervisors for certified problem gambling counselor interns in Nevada, helping to grow the problem gambling counseling workforce and the availability of counseling to Nevadans throughout the state. Presently, there are just five treatment providers in Nevada, and they are all located in Clark or in or near Washoe County. We know Nevadans who are unable to gamble responsibly reside throughout our state and in our remaining 15 counties and believe the provisions of this bill will help bring greatly needed counseling services to those areas where in-person counseling services presently do not exist. Currently in Nevada, there are 6% of individuals who exhibit the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for gambling disorder. Sadly, only 1% of the population is accessing help. It is the hope that recently implemented programs will push more individuals to access services. The workforce is a vital piece to facilitating the services that are needed. We applaud Senator Lang for bringing forward this bill and urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here in Crescent City? In Las Vegas, in support? Broadcast anyone on the phones? Chair, your public line is open and working, but you have no callers at this time. Okay. Give it a couple of minutes. Any change? Broadcast? You have no callers at this time, Chair. Okay, we'll move now to those in opposition, either here in Carson City. Vegas, anyone on the phones? Okay, Senator Lane, you have any closing remarks? Thank you, Chair Spearman. So the overarching goal of this is to get more problem gambling counselors in Nevada, but first we must have the supervisors to be able to supervise the counselors. And so I urge your support of Senate Bill 91. Thank you. Thank you, and I forgot neutral, so took it out of order. Anybody, anybody here want to testify in neutral? Okay. Thank you, Senator Lang. Thank you, Ms. Adler. Uh, Ms. Pittman, thank you. And so with that, uh, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 91, and on Monday we had most of the chambers in here giving a presentation, um, but we did not have um, Las Vegas. So... Metro Chamber, Mr. Moratkin. Good morning, Chair Spearman, members of the committee, Paul Moratkin, Senior Vice President for the Vegas Chamber. I apologize for not being here on Monday. We were back in Las Vegas for our own legislative presentation, so thank you for this opportunity this morning. Um, for those on uh, Nellis and so forth, we do have the presentation available to you, and I'd like to start off sharing some highlights of the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber was founded in 1911. We are in our 112th year of the organization. We are Nevada's largest and broadest based or business association in the state. We're also one of the largest, one of the oldest also in Nevada. Our, many of you know our president CEO, Mary Beth Seedwell. Um, we have over 30 employees dedicated to serving our members throughout the state. Um, we are the largest chamber in terms of staffing also. Many of you also know our board chairman this year, Paul Anderson from Boyd Gaming. And we have 45 business leaders uh, and community leaders that serve on our board of trustees that oversee the strategic vision of the organization. We also have our government affairs committee that oversees our policy positions and our political operations within the organization. 
And of course, many of you are familiar with our Leadership Foundation that oversees our leadership programs such as Leadership Las Vegas and Vegas Young Professionals. That are, that's in a separate 501c3. Uh, the Vegas Chamber is driven by its purpose of Nevada's thrives and Nevada employers thrive. Cultivating growth and prosperity is our purpose. This is our mission um, focus for our organization. And it's based off of several uh, points that we share with you on the PowerPoint today about economic climate necessity for entrepreneurs and for employers to grow and create jobs and sustainable careers for our employees, providing resources to our small business members to help them operate and take care of their employees. And we also serve as a convener in our community and our state to address policy issues and bring folks together to move Nevada forward. And of course, developing leaders for the next generation of leadership in our community. Our chamber values, any, any strong organization of course has values and our organization has seven of them. I won't go through all of them, but I know one of our favorite ones we like to talk about is Vegasness. And only in Vegas can you have the spirit and entrepreneurship that we have in our community. Of course, we also focus on advocacy, accessibility, community, which is our core of what our organization does, our tenacity, and our empowerment. We believe it's important to empower the next generation of leaders and to train those future generation to make our community stronger from the one they found. An uh, important part of any chamber of commerce, as you heard in the last few days, is our member services. And our organization is committed to ensure that we support all the sectors of our membership, large and small. We have the Employee Nevada Business Hub, which is in collaboration with Workforce Connections, which we were the first to offer such a facility for a chamber in the country in our offices, and many of you know Jaime Cruz at Workforce Connections. We have also the Senate Nevada Workforce Solutions a Portal, which is the one stop for our members to utilize and for employees looking for career changes or training assistance. We have the U.S. Bank Coaching and Growth Center that's available to our members free uh, as complimentary within our building, and they have staffers housed in our facility also. Of course, the like our chamber, like many other chambers, offer health insurance for our small members from 2 to 50. Our particular plans offer through Anthem Blue Cross. We also offer uh, 401k retirement plans for our small members, so they're able to provide that to their employees if they don't offer them directly themselves. And of course, our small business resources. For the Chamber of Commerce, we're 83.4. 83.7% small business, and for our de definition of our organization, we say it's 50 or less um, total employment count. And of course, we have a variety of partnership programs that many of you are familiar with, um, Home Ownership Advantage Program, America First Credit Union, Merchant Services, which helps the credit card services, um, eLife Life Partners, Nevada Drug Card that offers dis discounts on prescription drugs, Office Depot, which is one of our most popular programs that offers discounts um, for our members at Office Depot for office supplies, and so on. Um, just to give a snapshot of the chamber, and as we talk about being a broad-based business organization, I won't go through all these, our chamber represents 70 different industry sectors. So when we're talking about policy and so forth, it's our responsibility to look at those policy bills from all those different sectors. Um, everything from accounting to business services to um, hotels, healthcare, um, dry cleaning, uh, hospitality, um, dental, medicine, employment services, a variety of food and beverage, film, of course, um, gaming. Um, just gives you an idea of all the different sectors in our membership, and those are the folks we speak for every single day in this building, and of course, your constituents also. Um, sorry, many slides of all the different sectors. Uh, many of you are familiar with our signature events and programming. Many of you have participated in chamber programming in Southern Nevada. Many of you have joined us for our Washington, D.C. fly-in, preview Las Vegas, which we just had in January. Business Expo, Small Business of the Year Awards, our Business Power Luncheons, our Eggs and Issues Federal Breakfast Series. Our Executive Women's Council is one of the ones I'd like to highlight today. That is a group of 75 C-suite women and young emerging entrepreneurs that we provide service to and programming. And this is a phenomenal component of our membership and one of our, one of our highlights that we offer at the Chamber. Hospitality Heroes, which highlights our workers in the hospitality industry in con con conjunction with the LVCVA. Of course, our, our Leadership Foundation, that many of you are again aware with, with Leadership Las Vegas, Access Las Vegas, um, and I know several of you are graduates, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, our MAC Military Council and MAC Night Out, this has become one of our most popular programs in the organization. This is where the Chamber partners with Screech and Nellis Air Force Base, and every year we host a, a major event in the Westgate where we celebrate our air servicemen and our veterans in our community. And this is a free event for them. Um, our sponsors pay for their tickets and their spouses or partners where we recognize and thank them for our contributions for, for not just our, to our community, but our service to our country, and so forth. Our policy committees, of course, in our organization, we have nine of them. Southern Nevada Forum, uh, many of you have been engaged with the forum, have chaired the forum, so thank you for all those efforts on those committee members who've done that, of course. And our Vegas Young Professionals. 
And that's where we're grooming the next generation of business leaders in the community. This is from 21 to 39. Um, it's, and it's about over 1,000 uh, members in this particular program, to my understanding. I've aged out. Uh, so it's a great way to, for them to meet our members, learn what's happening in the business community, and become an asset not just to themselves, but to their companies and to their fellow um, coworkers. And of course, respecting the time of the committee, I want to be brief, but I'm happy to answer any questions for the committee today, Madam Chair. Questions, committee? Okay. Right. I guess you covered everything. All right. Thank you, <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we will go now to public comment. Is there any public comment here in Carson City or in Vegas? Broadcast, we have anyone on the phone? Broadcast, we have anyone on the phone for public comment? Chair, your public line is open and working and you have no callers at this time. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and so just before we leave, I just need to uh, say something to uh, committee members and those of you who are in the room. Uh, I am really passionate about veterans and active military. Um, I don't, when I speak, I don't intend to impugn anyone's integrity uh, or anything of that nature. I'm just really passionate um, about that. My final assignment was at the Pentagon, and I was stationed in the operations center during the height of the Iraqi war when people were getting blown up and heads were getting chopped off. And so that's, that's a button for me. That's a button for me. So if I offended anyone, I will apologize that I offended you, but I can't apologize for my stance for um, military and for veterans. So I hope you all will still like me <laughs> after that. <laughs> ah, and with that, we will close this edition of Commerce and Labor, and we will not meet on Friday. We'll be back again on Monday at 8 o'clock. Thank you. We're adjourned.